What you're telling me is that music is about to stop, and we're going to be left holding the biggest bag of odorous excrement ever assembled in the history of Gap Desert. 1974, 1987, 92, 97, 2000, and whatever we want to call this. It's all just the same thing over and over. We can't help ourselves. I say when we sell. Hey, 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 I say when we sell. The button has been hit, gentlemen. We've got four of us in the studio today. It's great to have everybody in person. Yeah. Jesse, how are you? Be here, Marty. <laughs> <laughs> this is some production magic by Logan behind the uh, the computer back here in the studios in the Bitcoin Commons in Austin, Texas. Big week down here in Austin. We got the Bitblock Boom Conference this weekend, tomorrow and Saturday, and there <clears throat> is an army of Bitcoiners in town for a slew of events. Uh, activities started last night rolling into today energy is high obviously we got people in town from all over the country all over the world one of those being brian cabellas brian welcome to the show thank you for having me great well, to be here welcome to the bitcoin capital of the world as well i, think. Yes. I wasn't sure if great Parker. to be in austin my first time first time at big block boom pump for it first time big block boom yeah first one it's the first one i'm gonna miss well you're Sorry. gonna be here for a majority of it don't sell yourself short no i have to leave tomorrow morning oh really yeah hey, i have a wedding Oh, I thought you were leaving. Tomorrow. First, I'm going to miss. I've been to everyone. Gary, if you're listening, I'm deeply sorry. Not disappointed because it's not something I can control. I can't control when two people decide to get married. It just so happened to be on the weekend of Bitblock Boom. Um, but it's a great, a great conference. You, you, you should. Um, you made it to the one that really counted, which was the 2020. Yes. Where it all started. Yes. The conference in the middle of, of COVID lockdowns. We all came to Texas. Some of us got COVID, but we all, I think everybody survived. I don't think we lost anybody, <laughs> but uh, we're here. Jesse's in town, floating. Yeah, I uh, flew in uh, five minutes before the podcast. <laughs> it's great to have you. Um, sorry we stuck you in this tight little corner here. Yeah, for people who can't see, uh, uh, Logan uh, spun up a, a little picture in picture where it looks like I'm part of the crew, but it's just my disembodied head. <laughs> When uh, you said you, you flew in or just flew in, it, it hit me with uh, Brian was saying coming in from New York. I was like, I don't even, I can't own do it justice. How was the heat when you uh, stepped I off mean, the plane? Yeah, it was a ton of bricks coming out of the uh, coming out of the airport. wasn't wasn't fully prepared for it. <laughs> Humidity straight to the face. Um, but yeah, like one ten. That's my Uber driver was telling me like, oh, it's going to be really cool today. I looked at my weather app. It's going to be one hundred and ten. I'm like, okay, I guess that's that's cool for here. For now, I do yeah, I love mean, that. I love that departure out of the uh, ATX airport, and and you hear like the grackle noises, and it's like ah, uh, yeah, the humidity. Suddenly, your hair picks up, and <laughs> you know you're about to eat some barbecue. It's a uh, it's a character builder, gentlemen, for sure. You know, sure. I was uh, I went on a seven mile walk this morning in the heat. You know, it's nice to get a good sweat in. I don't want to humble brag <laughs> on the show, but I guess I just did. You did. I mean, I like in I like in the heat um, and and when individuals complain about it to uh, Bitcoin's volatility. It's just like a, it's a it's a it's a filter. Like you, you if you can't handle the heat, like should you really be in Texas? Like what, what do you stand for? You know? like yeah. What's the, the volatility? Old saying, if you can't handle the heat, get out of the kitchen. Can't handle the heat, get out of Texas. I think that's how it goes. It's a inherent like friction. There's a you have to jump. If the the weather was always like San Diego, it it, w it would be a different place. Get complacent. Yeah, you get soft. I mean, people from California are really soft. <laughs> it seems to be true. <laughs> <clears throat> this isn't a weather podcast or a manosphere podcast. We're not here to call people soft. We're here to talk about Bitcoin. <laughs> Brian, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? You had a strategy and research at OnRamp. You've yep. been doing some incredible things behind the scenes on the research side, on the content side. Why don't you give us a little bit of information about your background, how you got into Bitcoin, and why you decided to join the on-ramp team. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's been uh, it's been an interesting and, and long journey. I mean, I, um, you know, when I was back in undergrad, so I graduated 2014 from, from University of Virginia, and, um, you know, at the time, I, I majored in econ and history, and 
at the time, I didn't know that that would be sort of a formative foundation for eventually understanding Bitcoin. But, you know, I, I didn't really come across Bitcoin in a real way until much later than that, you know, 2017, 2018. Um, but I think that that was formative in terms of just getting my bearings on, you know, history. And, and you know, I took multiple courses around like the history of technology. So I already always had an appreciation for innovative things and, and trying to you know, dive deep into into those sorts of things. And and from there, you know, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do after that. Right. Like coming out of college, I really all I knew is I wanted to move to New York and be in the finance world generally, um, which was sort of the case for a lot of people in my circles. Like that was just kind of that was the route. Right. And um, so I applied to you know a bunch of different banking positions and, and ultimately um, found my way to Brown Brothers Harriman, which is a, a large private bank um, headquarters in New York, but they have offices um, around the country and globally. Um, and there, you know, I was there for eight years. And so I was, you know, throughout that period became very ingrained in sort of the traditional finance world. And um, at the onset, I was actually more on like the relationship side of things. And pretty early on in that, in that role, I, um, I kind of decided that, you know, I was much more interested in sort of the investment side of, of the business. So I was within the private bank and there's a few different business lines at, at Brown brothers, but, um, the private banking business line is, you know, lots of high net worth clients, some endowments and foundations. And, um, it's unique in the sense that, um, it's largely like a discretionary model. So, you know, clients can sort of like opt out of certain strategies or investments, but for the most part, like they take the, the investment team's best thinking, right? And so I eventually moved away from sort of the relationship side of things and got onto the sort of centralized investment team within the private bank. And it was a small flat team and, and was, you know, working directly with our CIO. And um, it was a really just formative experience for me because, you know, I was my early twenties and, and, you know, my day to day was, effectively going out and diligencing, you know, third party managers. So anything from, you know, hedge funds to long only equity strategies, private equity, you know, I was a generalist and we were all generalists. So got to work sort of across the asset cl class spectrum. And um, really every day I was just sort of like picking the brains of some of the smartest investors in the world. And so along that journey, I, I mean, Brown Brothers, like I said, is a very old institution founded in 1818. You know, they're very um, generally like conservative in, in their in their thinking and had a very um, value oriented investment philosophy. And so that's that's sort of how I honed my own investment philosophy was through that lens of value investing. And, and you know, generally, you know, we were all sort of praising at the altar of Warren Buffett to an extent. Right. Like Warren Buffett, Ben Graham, security analysis, all that stuff, buying things, you know, cheaply and 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 basically understanding the fundamentals and the long-term trajectory of something. Um, and so that was, that was sort of how I, I honed my own personal investment philosophy over that time was by talking to, you know, some really smart people um, and, and ultimately, you know, making investment decisions and allocating capital on, on behalf of our, our private clients. Um, and so, you know, I, like I said, I, I didn't really come across Bitcoin until sort of late 2017 end of that bull run. And, you know, I had buddies who were like pulling out their Coinbase apps and like showing me this thing. I was like, okay, um, seems interesting, but I don't really know what this thing is. Um, I think it was around that time that I actually heard of you, Marty, from the Barstool days, um, <laughs> Tales from the Crypt. And uh, that sort of prompted me to take a, take a deeper look, honestly. And, and like I said, like I had that sort of history in, in fascination around new technologies and innovation. And, and it sort of, the whole area sort of struck me immediately as like, there's so much intellectual capital moving towards this thing um, that it was hard to ignore. And so, so from sort of 2017 to 2021, I was still at Brown Brothers and, you know, having that value investing lens, but sort of on my own personal time, trying to apply that lens to Bitcoin effectively. And, you know, it's not entirely intuitive that value, the value investing framework could be applied to something like Bitcoin. Because if you, you know, if you read security analysis, you go back to all these sort of frameworks, you know, they're, they're really more geared towards securities, right? Like cash flowing businesses. Um, and so it was my only lens though at the time. And so like 
you know, that that's what I had been learning and experiencing throughout my career. And so I just sort of forced, you know, force functioned it, force applied that lens to this thing that was Bitcoin and ultimately found that there's a lot of sort of foundational tenets of value investing that really apply to the Bitcoin thesis and, and being able to understand Bitcoin. Um, and we can we can go more into into that, but just yeah. to sort of continue the story a bit, um, you know, at sort of uh, end of 2020, I guess, early 21, um, or no, end of 21, early 22, um, I kind of realized like, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't changing hearts and minds within Brown Brothers. Like it was, I would try to talk to my CIO and, and you know, chief uh, investment, you know, chief strategists and economists that, that were there, talk to them about Bitcoin and just, you know, pick their brain on it and see if they were even open to it. And it largely, largely fell on deaf ears. And so um, I kind of realized at a certain point, like in order to really embrace this thing and, you know, not only learn more about it, but just be serious about it. And more so align what I was becoming very passionate about with sort of my occupational trajectory. Like I needed to eventually leave Brown Brothers. And so actually before I left, um, it was interesting because there was, there was sort of this like working group, like a digital asset working group at Brown <laughs> Brothers. It wasn't actually within the private bank. It was with, in another business line, our investor services business line, which actually got bought by State Street like a year or two years ago. Um, but that, that business line was more of like a global custody business. And within there, there was a working group that was just thinking about digital assets, but, and I, and so I talked to them and, and like, you know, tried to see if there was a fit there where I could help them better understand this thing. But they were so entrenched in blockchain, not Bitcoin at the time and like distributed ledger technology. And it was just kind of a non-starter. And, and I, I didn't want to be in the position of having to really convince these people that of something that I, I thought to be true and, and to be worthwhile. Um, and they were kind of just, you know, going along this other path. And so ultimately I, I left and, and started figuring out, you know, how I could sort of, you know, jump head first in, into Bitcoin and sort of the broader digital asset space. And um, I had a buddy who was at Coinbase at the time. And uh, he honestly pinged me and was like, you know, this, this, new position just got listed. seems like it's kind of up your alley. And so I applied to it and, and was hired as the first analyst to a dedicated research team within the institutional line of business at Coinbase. <clears throat> and to be honest, like, and I've told you this guy, you guys this before, but like, you know, at the time I, my, my main conviction was, was with Bitcoin. But, you know, at that point it was sort of me doing this on my personal time. Like I didn't feel necessarily like an expert on any of this. And so in some ways, the Coinbase opportunity was interesting to me because it would force me to, you know, test my hypothesis, right? Test my own thesis and, and really challenge myself to look at the rest of the crypto space and, you know, do actual diligence on it and, and ensure that, like, I'm not wrong about this stuff and that the, the rest of crypto, my, my skepticism was, was rooted in reality. Um, and so in that sense, it was a formative year. So, so I was there for about 12 months. Um, and it was a really interesting experience in, in, in many different respects, which I'm sure we'll get into. But the main one just being, again, codifying my own thesis um, around why Bitcoin is different. Um, and I always sort of had this trajectory in the back of my own mind, like I ultimately want to be working on Bitcoin only. Um, but, you know, coming from eight years in TradFi, didn't really know anything else, had only ever worked at one company, like making that jump, it felt, Coinbase honestly at the time felt like a safe bet because this was early 22, Luna, Terra was collapsing, like entering a bear market. I was pretty confident that like Coinbase wouldn't go out of business within the next like 12 months. Um, and so in that respect, it was a good opportunity that I felt confident in and always sort of viewed it as like a stepping stone to, to doing something in, in Bitcoin only. And then um, back in April of this year, saw Michael and Jesse on on your podcast, Marty, and um, heard about OnRamp and, and it really sort of immediately resonated with me in terms of the approach and, and how you guys were going about it. Because throughout my time at, at Brown Brothers and at Coinbase, um, 
I saw the gap in the market, like that white space of institutional capital that's still on the sideline. Maybe they're thinking about Bitcoin. They want to get exposure, but they're nervous for a variety of re reasons, whether it's regulatory fears, custodial risks, um, or just like a general lack of understanding. Um, and so I thought the approach that y'all were taking was spot on in that let's have a better custody setup. Let's continue to educate these people about this thing because it is complex and there is a lot of honestly misinformation out there and misunderstanding generally. Um, and so it just really struck me as something that, that could be really, really powerful. And so reached out to you guys and I guess the rest is history. And here we are. Here we are in Austin, Texas. <laughs> Michael Jew. <clears throat> I just, I think it's so interesting how uh, Brian's story is, is such a perfect little like microcosm of what's happening for lots of people uh, in our generation in particular. Like <clears throat> when you're working at a, at a large private bank with 200 years of history, um, you're not going to get far talking about digital assets yet um, with leadership. Well, and okay. Marty, that's one yeah. thing I want to jump into. So this Brown brothers has been around for 205 <laughs> years. Like to make it this far, they had to be pretty conservative, yep. like mm -hmm. you said, but also innovative in a way to be able to adapt and survive for two centuries. Like, okay. I'm not going to try and get yeah. you to talk, but like, well, I, I, like you, you survive by, by not being the first through the door. Uh, when any new trend arrives or something changes, but you know, you, you move when the, when the middle of the bell curve is starting to move, right? Like the, for sure. I that, think, that's a big I think part of it. Different... That's a big part of it, Jesse. It's like the career risk associated with diving into something like Bitcoin. It's just not worth it to those people, right? Like right. they'd rather see it. They'd rather see other people try it first and, and make sure that they're not going to be, you know, coming out looking foolish. Yeah. The gravity of, being the uh, the managing team that's holding the bag when a multi-century institution goes down is not yeah it's pretty heavy I imagine yeah. I think um <clears throat> I think this is really where um, a lot of the weight falls on on your shoulders and and not just yours but uh, there's a lot of the opportunity and it hasn't been figured out yet in the delivery for these firms and how do you package what's happening here in a way to meet them. And we think we're starting to do that. And, and that's where a lot of the things that we're doing are intentional, including this podcast, but we've seen glimpses of this. Um, Parker's writing gradually and suddenly is an excellent um, example of a, a Ross Stevens, a Michael Saylor referencing it before they made large positions, delivering it. I think Jesse's content, there's a lot of versions of this, but it hasn't fully been put together in the right way for the experience um, that Brian's had to say, okay, well now we can like create the right playbook and the right way. And, and it's different mediums, right? It's like just when somebody gets Bitcoin, they don't ultimately, it, they all come from different angles. And um, so that's the, the rub. It's like, once it gets figured out, then everybody's just gonna like fall in, but it hasn't been done yet. And that's really like the opportunity. The, the, the back end stuff is interesting, right? Like better custody, better client services, all the things that, that still need to be done. But those, those are like the table stakes. It's the, the real like opportunity almost alpha is being able to figure out how do you actually deliver um, this value prop, this opportunity in a way that somebody says, oh my God, like there's something here. And it doesn't have to be a big position. It's just enough to like start looking at it. Cause we all know whether it's the single individual on cash app that buys a little bit or it's an institution with, you know, whatever small amount basis points, then everybody starts paying attention and then that's when it begins. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, and I think that part, you know, big, uh, this is a common talking point for me, but I think a big part of that is the, the having cadence where, you know, the having implements this increased scarcity, the price drifts upwards. Uh, it's a bull and it turns into a, a little mini, um, or not so mini bubble, uh, and then you know crashes and we have a higher low on the on the back end of that. But we've had three of those, and it's pretty easy to wave away the early days. You know, oh, the 2012 having who who really knows? It was starting from such a small point, and it was just drug money on the internet. So you know, wave away that one. And then there's and then you've got two data points of the having happening and a bull market following. 
So you can't really rely on that if you're, you know, if you're thinking from like a, a traditional investment point of view. But here comes another one. And if, if it happens again, how many people start to view that career risk of continuing to ignore it, um, becoming, you know, competing with the career risk of, of, of taking the risk of entertaining it as, as a serious investment um, class. And so, you know, over time, I, I, I think that the, I think that the difficulty of understanding Bitcoin trends down if because yeah. more people are doing it, more people are creating content, explaining it. There's a longer track record, more Lindy. Um, and there's more data points of what happens when a, a having rolls through. And that downward trend of, of the difficulty of understanding Bitcoin um, is what we're, you know, what we're relying on. Uh, people will get it as it gets easier to get. And we just need to be a part of communicating why it's happening. One thing to pull a little uh, on that thread of the the having and and you know the marketability and all the things with price appreciation is um there was a I share with Marty there I got an email from Namecheap for domains about uh, the <laughs> raising prices you know close to ten percent it was nine percent and um, it hit me that we've seen the having and there's you know been this consistent inflation since Bitcoin's existed but it hasn't been like uh, the inflation topic hasn't been at the forefront. And so thinking about that just contrast next year when the supply cuts in half programmatically while well, inflation runs and it will run, we see it, even though people say 3%, it's just going to be magnificent to see just in real time that happen. Well, it's funny because um, the last having April, May, 2020, whenever it was exactly, I forget, but that was right at the beginning of the massive monetary base expansion and yep. diving of interest rates post COVID lockdowns. So we have like two halvings bookending, like the uh, the beginning and the end of, of that saga. Six trillion in that, <laughs> that time, six trillion printed. Yeah. And, and the mainstream point of view at that time, it, it was May 2020, um, was that there wouldn't be any inflation from stimulus. Like that was still the firmly right. held belief of everyone, uh, except these crazy Bitcoiners who were saying, you can't just print a bunch of money and not expect inflation to creep through the system. Um, and then it, it, we weren't even yet at inflation is transitory at that point. That came a right. few months later. So, you know, I think Michael's right that the, the, in a way, the Overton window of is inflation a part of our landscape has shifted in this last four years. <laughs> and so now we're going into a new. Can we play the J Powell clip? Do we have it? Uh, did you get, put it in Slack? I can, I can send it to Logan. Send it to Logan. But before we even get into that, like the J Powell clip that we're referencing was, I think it was a representative from Nevada asked him why the fed targets 2% inflation. Like why did they pick that number? And his response was pretty funny. But beyond that, uh, this week, Harvard economist, Jason Furman wrote an op-ed in the wall street journal saying that the fed should target 3%. Uh, that was picked up on social media, uh, most notably by Paul Krugman, uh, a blogger for the New York Times who likes to think of himself as an economist. Uh, and he said, yes, we should be targeting 3% inflation. So again, going back to the Overton window shifting, it is even shifting at the academic economist level where they're <laughs> saying that the Fed needs to target uh, 3% inflation instead of 2%. And just the arbitrary nature of picking these inflation targets out of the hat is astonishing number one but number two the the impact and like that's a 50 percent increase of the inflation rate that you're going to target and that has material impacts of the speed at which the purchasing power of a dollar decays i believe the half-life of a dollar with two percent inflation something like 34 years at three percent it drops down to like 22 yeah, yeah 22 23 and uh, so i didn't know this fact but zero hedge tweeted about this this week of where does that 2% inflation target come from? Like this, this Australia. iron, this law. Yeah, it was, it, uh, Zero had said it was uh, uh, New Zealand in the 1980s. Uh, it was just like a, a thing they tried. Oh, and, uh, and that became, you know, oh, oh, this this little experiment from um, 1983 to 1988 suddenly becomes, in New Zealand, suddenly becomes like the... 
hard, hard and fast rule of economics globally uh, indefinitely into the future. How the hell did that happen? And it just shows you how arbitrary it really is. Well, not only is it arbitrary, in the context of the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve has two mandates, price stability and um, making sure that, that unemployment is yeah, tempered. Full employment. full employment and price stability. A 2%... Yep. They're doing a magnificent job, by the way. <laughs> what do you mean? Not just being facetious. A two percent inflation target or a three percent now inflation target. It's a literal double speak. Like their mandate is price stability, and they attempt to create price stability by targeting a perpetual inflation rate of two, or now potentially three percent, which over a thirty-three year period is extremely unstable. <laughs> it literally decays the purchasing power by fifty percent. Yeah, and, and that's where all the charts from what the fuck happened in 1971 come from. For anyone who hasn't checked out that website, WTF happened in 1971.com. Just a collection of charts of like, there's a, a, uh, a divergence that occurs in all of these economic indicators around 1971 when we went off the gold standard. And the the most painful one in, in my book is the the... Productivity and compensation were lockstep up until 1971. And then productivity continues chugging on up and to the right. And compensation, really meaning for the working class, flatlines there. Because that's when we started to see more inflation. And the easiest thing to do is just kind of lag on keeping up with workers' wages, like to update workers' wages in line with true inflation pretty easy to fudge the numbers or just kind of delay on that or obfuscate from the fact that workers salaries aren't aren't uh, earning as much anymore and that right there that little trend the divergence of those two lines is i think the the heart of the decay of the american middle class since 1971 like and you know the rise of like the hillbilly elegy kind of suffering of the working class in America and the rise of populist politicians like like Trump is because of the pain, the the perceived um, falling out of middle class stat- status and into uh, you know um, poverty that so many um, um, blue collar folks have suffered and families and communities have suffered over the last 50 years. And it all comes back to that inflation driver. How, how did, uh, Brown's brothers, like it, I would imagine inflation doesn't get talked about when it's an analysis. No, yeah, it's just that's the benchmarks was, are completely different. I was going to go there with it. Like when I said, you know, I would talk to people about Bitcoin. Um, you know, this is three, four years ago now, and it fell on deaf ears was largely because they didn't think inflation was a problem (laughs) and it was just like a complete blind spot um and you know historically had like no exposure to gold like they didn't because of that value investing framework there's almost there's almost this reluctance to even think about hard assets because because there's no yield there's no yield and there's no like (laughs) advanced models and due diligence that you can rely on to say, oh, I've done the work, this thing is cheap. Um, so it's, it's inherently harder to value. Um, and so, you know, what I found is like, there was sort of this, almost an air of sophistication around value investing that sort of like perpetuated the idea of it being a, a, a valuable thing. And, and to be clear, like, I do think there is merit to a lot of it, right? Like buying something for cheaper than it's worth should be an axiom of all investing, right? Um, And and Jesse, going back to what you were saying about the cyclical nature of the thing, um, you know, one of one of the way one of the first ways that I sort of tried to apply that lens to Bitcoin was saying volatility is not risk. Like that's a fundamental core piece of, of the value investing framework is that volatility is actually your friend like you know buffett has a ton of quotes around that it's an opportunity to get in cheaply right like you should you should be comfortable with that volatility because if you have a real deep fundamental understanding of the thing and its trajectory and it, and what you think it will be valued in the future as the market comes to appreciate that value 
volatility is, is just an opportunity, right? And it's not a risk. And, and the, the unfortunate thing about the cyclical nature in some way is that people perceive that as risk. And it's like, it, it's just, they're missing the point in that, you know, Bitcoin has its own risks, right? It's not necessarily risk-free. We might think it is, but like th there's perceived risks around it, but it's not that it's volatile. Like that is not the risk. Um, but that seems to be, you know, a big sticking point for people still, which, which is wild to me. But, you know, that was, that was one of the first ways that I applied that lens in saying the near-term volatility is just noise. And this is just an opportunity to get a better entry. Yeah. I think an example of that's also the hurdle rate is Jesse and I were talking about, it's like, well, what is the true hurdle rate? And there's the numbers on the sophisticated version or the hurdle, the true hurdle rate would be your cost or the, the purchasing power of your right. money. And that's not how they measure it. They measure it from a, a nominal yeah. versus real. And so there it's a game that's being played. That's just, it's, it's the wrong game. And uh, that's, I think, part of why it's so hard, because it's an ephemeral academic exercise versus we, I think Marty and I were talking about it last night. It's like at the end of the day for us as individuals, you have to look at um, like a portfolio or how you would map to like, you know, whether whether it's real estate equities in the bank. But we know what, what just happened with Silicon Valley Bank. And then we know that SF and these cities are starting, you know, the liquidity of real estate It's like. So at the end of the day, if you need to put food on the table and you need your money to work, well, then where do you start to look? And that is like at the micro level. But when you go back to the macro, it gets so hard to get from there to, the, to that point. Um, and I think that the overarching point that we were getting into during that part of the discussion last night was in building on your comments about volatility. Yes, the volatility is there. It's not a risk. I can stomach the volatility because I know the liquidity profile, if I'm holding Bitcoin a certain way, is better than anything right. on the planet outside of like cash in your pocket. Maybe even better. Like I can- It's definitely better. Send Bitcoin whenever I want, uh, anywhere around the world. If I need to liquidate on an exchange, they t trade 24-7, 365. Like that volatility is easy to stomach when you know that, that liquidity profile is there. And then if you're holding it in self-custody, like that counterparty risk is eliminated. You have your money. You can go buy groceries if you need to. If you're holding real estate, very liquid. Uh, yeah. Stocks even, not as liquid. Yeah, yeah that, that was my, my uh, recent uh, piece was to try to um, explore the opportunity cost of capital between different uh, asset classes. And right now, uh, you U.S. Treasuries are yielding 4.3% a year, which is just, in terms of recent history high. Um, and you know, then then equities over the last 30 years deliver 8% uh, on average. Your average compounding annual growth rate, your Kager, and um, uh, private equity 15%, and venture capital 25%. Um, and whereas Bitcoin over the last halving era has returned 45% uh, annually on average. And there's been a diminishing over time of, of the annual growth rate. But looking forward, you know, what, what will it be? I think it's reasonable to conclude that because of the, in the playing out of, of the halving mechanics and following the same diminishing returns over time, a phenomenon, something like 25%, which would mean that Bitcoin with the liquidity characteristics of US treasuries, aka you can buy it and sell it immediately. You can, you, there's no uh, lockup time period that you have to hold it. Whereas with private equity funds or venture capital funds, you are locking up your capital for 10 years. Um, so with Bitcoin, you get US treasuries liquidity and, uh, and you know time periods um but you get venture capital returns uh going forward so that becomes the and, and, it, and an important part of that is assessing that it's actually low risk because the volatility is is misdiagnosed as risk but it's not risk it it's just volatility um so you have a low risk asset with 
great liquidity that delivers venture capital returns. And so then that becomes the, the opportunity cost for any incremental dollar um, for, you know, where, where should you park your dollars? You want to park it in the place that has the best opportunity um, and lowest risk. And Bitcoin seems to have the lowest risk, you know, or, or at least matches, in my opinion, um, is better than U.S. Treasuries and yet delivers the highest risk um, asset classes returns. Looking forward, there are assumptions there, but um, that's the place to hold capital then. And, I, and you know, then the, the entire world of value has to learn this lesson that the four of us have stumbled into earlier and everyone listening to this podcast just happened to stumble into this, this stupid, simple um, North Star of investing in modern era, which is Bitcoin should be the default. I was going to say, like, I think this is a really interesting conversation to be diving into right now because like value investing is like really hard these days. Like Fed's monetary policy really dictates the perceived value of any given company on the market at uh, any given point in time, particularly the public markets. And I think an important point to add to this conversation is like through Bitcoin and eventually if Bitcoin does become the reserve currency of the world, we'll actually be able to get back to value investing the correct way, which is you have a monetary system uh, that operates on a sound monetary policy, and then you actually bring opportunity cost back to the market, a true cost of capital back to the market, and then you can actually do good due diligence uh, as a value investor. Yeah. You actually make good decisions about what's actually producing SATs flows. And right what is actually producing value and not just, just something that's manipulated by Fed policy. So, so two things. Um, that was something that I was, I don't know who I, I was talking about it with, but it's like, what is the cost of capital? Like, what is the true cost of capital? And I don't know if we, if we, we know, don't, we have no it's idea. Like, yeah. You know, but even on bit with Bitcoin, it's like, like, what is your Bitcoin worth today to give up for tomorrow, whether it's the equity in a, in a, in a firm or, you know, risk adjusted if what the Bitcoin would be in the future. Um, and then what ultimately, if we're on a Bitcoin standard, what is the interest rate that would need to be returned if you were going to give up your Bitcoin um, to invest in something? And so it's just an interesting thought experiment um, that we'll see play out. But going back to what Jesse was saying about um, uh, the benchmark with venture, that is caveating in the upper quartile, which almost nobody gets access to. <laughs> just right. to, no, yeah. just to get, but yeah. so so that's just this. So it's a, it's a lot more like a ten x more pronounced in like that delta of that most people are losing all their money if they go into right. to venture. Yeah. It's like two to three percent, and the equity returns too. Like yeah, eight percent. But what is that in real terms? No exactly. One, no one's thinking it's about it in real terms. And and Marty just going touching on on the point you just made around how value investing is so hard now. You've seen that reflected in, you know, the past two decades of really underperformance, generally speaking, from sort of value, strict value strategies compared to like growth strategies, where you're really just chasing revenue and tra chasing growth, and that is a function of that low cost of capital, right? And so right. you've seen this divergence over the past 20 years, where these value strategies have largely underperformed. Um, and then at the same time, because of that dynamic, you've seen massive concentration in the actual indices of, you know, the, we've seen the charts of like the top six to seven companies accounting for the vast majority of the performance of the index. And so that's, you know, also indicative of the general sort of shift from active investing to passive investing. And, and really like it, it's, it's getting to your point much harder to actually uh, execute a, a value oriented strategy where you're going to outperform the S and P like it's, it's extraordinarily <laughs> difficult. Um, if you're being sort of strict about, um, margin of, sa of safety and like, and how you're, you know, the price at which you're entering a certain security, um, it just becomes very, very difficult. And, and, you know, when I was at Brown brothers, like, you know, sitting on the allocator side, um, I mean, we had a few, we had a few sort of challenges in that, one was like sort of logistically, like we were allocating from a you know, 50 to $60 billion base of capital. And so if we wanted to go out to a manager and, and make a 1% position, you're talking about a half a billion dollars. And so 
really talented managers with like outstanding track records don't have half a billion of capacity to give you. So we were in this interesting situation where we were trying to thread this needle of really talented, smart people have a great track record, but also can, you know, take a billion dollars from us because, you know, ideally we, I mean, we were making allocations, the, the entire aggregate portfolio was actually relatively concentrated in the sense that there weren't a ton of managers, right? Like if you go to like a Goldman Sachs or one of these other sort of more commercial private banks, they give you a roster of 300 to 400 funds to pick from. And like I mentioned, like our model was much more discretionary where we were actually creating policy portfolios with a concentrated roster of managers. And, you know, we had sort of four different portfolios and it sort of varied by client risk appetite. And, you know, on, on sort of the stable value side, it was much, much higher percent um, to bonds and then sort of on the growth side, obviously a higher allocation to equities, but it became very difficult um, to, to find managers that we were comfortable with and, and fit our mandate strategically and, and philosophically, but we're also able to, to take our money basically um, because those people who are really good and have a 10 year track record, like their fund is full and, they, and they're not going to take your money. And so, I mean, a lot of our best investments were actually finding like investors who had a track record somewhere else and then spun out and started their own thing. And then we could become like an anchor investor um, and get a lot of capacity. Um, but it's interesting because, you know, one thing that I noticed while I was there is that you know, if you've heard sort of the phrase like style drift in investing, like, generally seen as a bad thing, right? And, I, and you know, I think Gary from last week was talking about this a bit in terms of like, you know, there's sort of this perception that as an investor, or as a portfolio manager, like you need to have your strategy, your process, your philosophy, and it needs to be repeatable. And if you're drifting from that, it's a bad thing. And so like when we were, you know, we would onboard a fund and, and we would have sort of quarterly calls with them and do annual reviews of the fund. And, and one of the things that we were assessing was is there any style drift here? Are they are they changing their strategy at all? Is there anything we should be concerned about? Are they doing things that they previously said they would never do? Um, and interestingly, over time, not only did we see it at the manager level, but we actually saw it at our level, like our investment team level, because value was underperforming for a decade, and we had a we had a bias towards these value strategies, and so you know there were years where we were underperforming the market and we started to sort of in some ways chase growthier strategies. And so you did see that style drift even from our point of view. But I guess what I come back to is what Gary said last week in that I don't think that's a bad thing. Like you should be able to adapt and be and be flexible and, and understand new things and, and be willing to change your mind about stuff. Um, and so I think in a weird way, like style drift over the long term, it's kind of like a good thing for Bitcoin because ultimately people will wake up to this thing and they'll they'll be more open-minded about it. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Hey, <clears throat> you have to be adaptable and flexible as time changes, policy changes. Like that yep. makes a lot of sense. Uh, I want to um, apologize to anybody watching the video right now. We've got former MLB all-star CJ Wilson doing some calisthenics right behind us in the video. Sorry if that's, <laughs> that's distracting for you. Um, no, but it's, it's hard out there. Like, like, and I, I listen to an invest like the best podcast. Uh, Patrick O'Shaughnessy interviewed um, David Einhorn, who's an infamous yep. value investor of the last thirty years, and he essentially admitted on that podcast he's like, I think value investing's dead at the moment. Like it's yeah. literally yeah. impossible to allocate as and, a value investor. And that's that's a, a, a symptom of the money dying. Like when when the measuring stick starts yep. to make less sense as a, as a, as a place to store your value, your savings, you shift your strategy to what makes sense. And in over the last 20 years, what's emerged is pile it into your 401k. And so there's this, this automatic bid every two weeks, um, in America of equities being bid up and, and really your core equities and, and that sort of starting to trend towards, fang stocks like that becomes money that's that's the monetization of tech stocks over the last 10 20 years and and then you start to see these silly price pe ratios uh, price to earnings ratios of uh it, it, which are outside of what is you know value investing is designed around finding pe ratios that 
are are uh, low. What's uh, what's Nvidia's PE ratio after this week? Are they up like another twenty five percent? Good question. I I don't I even know. It, it, there there's there's always those like few outliers that are silly, oh, right? Up. Like Rivian or or you know other EV companies in particular. There, there's this mimetic investing that has been a part of crypto investing and uh, and is very much a part of the stock market now, which is silly. Um, but it like th- that has crowded out value investing over time. Like Preston Pish talks about, he's Holy come crap. to this conclusion too of the, the thing that he's planning on doing is just holding Bitcoin <laughs> until it appreciates enough that uh, and restores sanity to markets such that pre- uh, value investing opportunities reemerge. Um, and, and that's his, that's going to be his strategy for the next decade or two. And, uh, yeah, I, 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 so I think that everybody is chasing, um, a, a way to store their money safely in the stock market. And, and that is where the mainstream continues to be. And yet, if you think through this logic and get to this conclusion that Bitcoin is delivering venture capital returns for us treasury's risk, that's the place to be. Yeah. Jesse, I want to, I want to see your live reaction to this chart. Um, we're about to pull out and you, Everybody's reaction is, is pretty, pretty insane. Nvidia's price to earnings ratio. It's the third chart. I I don't even know what like. I, I, oh boy, it's two forty five point five. So I I remember so, a decade ago people talking about like you know price to earnings ratios of thirty are are just silly high. Right. And now we've entered this this. <laughs> This absolute nonsense world, <laughs> two hundred. And, and one of the one of the knock on effects of this, you know, broader sort of consolidation of of indices and sort of chasing growth and and mega tap mega cap tech, is that it really hinders sort of the entire presentation and, and perception of value investing in the sense that you can't justify the fees. Like if if the best portfolio to own over the past two decades was like Google, Amazon, Apple, maybe a few others. No one's, no one should be paying you fees to do that. Right? Like you either just own the S and P or you own those five companies and it's pretty easy to do. Um, and so all of these active investors are now in the position of having to justify a 2% management fee and, and probably even a, a performance fee of some kind. Um, and that's just become, really, really hard to do in this context. Can you, so th- maybe this is a good transition to talk about, um, it, I think there's two parts what we're describing in um, traditional investors and in, in what uh, a portfolio and diversification and uh, how that fits into crypto and where individuals have come in and then um, what you saw at Coinbase, but then also some of the conversations we've been having of like, so wait, well, you know, we, what's the strategy? It's right. Like, in, yeah. No, I mean, Coinbase was interesting for a number of reasons. Um, I mean, in terms of just the mindset, it was it was such a stark difference from being at Brown Brothers for eight years. And I say that because, you know, part of that value investing philosophy, part of what I had honed my own investment philosophy on was a very long term approach, like a long term investment horizon and everything at Coinbase and in, in sort of the crypto world, generally speaking, is extremely short term in nature, right? Like you're thinking about things more so as a trader. And really, I mean, ultimately, the entire business model of Coinbase was inherently tied to that short termism and, and, and pushing people out the risk curve and getting them to trade all these other tokens. When in reality, like I wanted to be telling institutional clients, like you guys should just buy and hold Bitcoin. Um, but that was not, <laughs> that was not aligned with the business model of Coinbase, as you might imagine. Um, so that was, that was certainly frustrating in a, in a certain sense, but it was kind of just interesting to see that, that, that stark difference of short termism, move out the risk curve, trade all these tokens. And at the same time, you know, I, being there, I really saw sort of under the hood of a lot of just inherent conflicts of interest at the business um, <laughs> where like, you know, at the same time where, you know, Coinbase is like a launch partner for token XYZ launch partner for 
X protocol and like being early liquidity to it. At the same time, like I'm being prompted to like maybe write about these things. And it's like, well, no, like I should just be coming at this from a first principles point of view and, and writing about what I think is interesting. And I tried to do that as much as I could, but ultimately there was some amount of like party line, right? Um, and so, you know, I, throughout that year, I, I forced myself to write about like Tezos and fucking like <sighs> Matic and some of these other coins. And, and frankly, I couldn't really write what I actually thought, which was frustrating and, and tiring in some sense. Um, you know, towards the end, towards the end of my stint there, I did write a report about Filecoin, which I thought was, was pretty good in the sense that like, it was probably the most like polite takedown of an altcoin that you could, you could write. Like it was just enough along party lines, but I was really just calling out the entire incentive models and just really calling it out for what it was. And, and um, yeah, I think there were some people that didn't like that report, but uh, it got published because it was all factual. It might be down the street, the file coin offices uh, <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> somewhere in the city. I mean, I do, I do think it's, it, and as you, I think recognize it is an important journey though, because um, it's one like to internally recognize it, but then it, it adds so much credibility when you go back to the market and it's like been on the other side of that. And I had to say, I was at the block for, you know, six months. I was like, holy crap, what am I doing here? You know, it's just like, <laughs> I was in Barstool trying to get everybody to stop trading Ascoin and <laughs> everything. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's, it's also formative in the, in the experience or getting to the place because it just requires, um, to hone the thesis, the understanding to see, and then also just go back to the market and explain that you said in that, the, those shoes you, you've experienced it, you understand the angle of the incentive model. So when they come in and it's, well, we got to diversify or we got to be more open minded. It's like, no, we actually don't. Like, let me explain why. Yeah. And that goes back to the value investing thing is like, you don't need diversification. Like if you know, the winners and you're confident in the trajectory of, of whatever you're looking at, you should size accordingly and what's, you should, you should mostly own that one thing. What's the quote of a diversification is selling your winners to buy losers. Yeah. yeah. Who, something, who says something that along those lines? I think sailor said that. I think it's is a it sailor. sailor? I mean, it's probably I, a, a tried yeah, and true. Yeah, I think it, I think it predates industry. sailor. Yeah, yeah. One. And, and I think Buffett likes to say that, uh, concentration is how you get rich and diversification is how you stay rich, something like that. Um, yeah. which is to say like, y y that's how you flatline your wealth relative to the rest of the world and, and maintain that, um, in, in the equities model in particular. But if you're trying to outperform, you have to concentrate. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, even just thinking about the, the funds that we had our, on our platform at Brown brothers, the best performing funds were the most concentrated funds, like long only equities, like six to seven stocks in the portfolio. And those were the best performers for the entire time that I was there. Um, so that that really resonated with me too. And, and I applied that lens to like, yeah, just think, just be focused on this one thing. And and you've got, uh, you've got Portnoy figuring out the, the takeaway from that after not too long in the stock market of stonks only go up. <laughs> <laughs> You're the green and hammer. It was it's uh, interesting. his latest his latest uh, comments on Bitcoin are interesting. Of the, he he plans to I, I guess it was with Jack Mallers on that podcast. Uh, he plans to put Bitcoin on the balance sheet when he when he gets the opportunity, which is uh, the the latest chapter in his long journey, isn't it, Marty? It is, Dave. I sent you a text earlier this week. <laughs> if you're listening to this, you should respond. Um, I think he's probably genuinely waking up. It's just a proxy for the does. amount of dollars. I it's mean. Like, I, I think what just happened to Barstool is sort of a product of what we're seeing in the markets right now with interest rates where they are. Obviously, Penn's stock was suffering. They had this opportunity to make a move with ESPN bets. They had to take it. Part of that was getting rid of Barstool, which was essentially a marketing arm for Penn Gaming, which is a loss leader. And they were spending millions of dollars via Barstool um, and not really making up for it with the sports book or the stock price, obviously. And so I think, yes, Dave got the company back. He's got a hundred percent. It's incredible. Um, but I do think <clears throat> there is an aspect of the current market conditions that really drove that decision for Penn. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's had, uh, he, he got into, I mean, everybody has their own journey. We're, we're, we've, we're hearing about Brian's journey and Dave Portnoy has his own very separate journey 
uh, and all of these journeys end up converging on Bitcoin ultimately, because in some way, wh whether you research it and you learn about how some of these altcoins are the incentives are screwed up and there's really they're, they're built on a foundation of sand, you can research your way into knowing that or you can get burned by touching the stove. And um, Dave Portnoy went into Bitcoin, then he quickly went moved on to Chainlink and other things. <laughs> And got burned, uh, and so a he, year ago, his 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 uh, conclusion was maybe Bitcoin's the only thing worth touching. But screw Chainlink. What was, That's where he was a year ago? Sailor Moon or Safe Moon? Safe Moon. That was <laughs> Sailor Moon Safe was moon. Uh, yeah. the anime cartoon on Cartoon Network. Um, <laughs> but uh, Dave's got some work to do. I listened to a couple clips from that um, Money Matters episode that Mallers and Dylan did with him. He's still. Is not fully Still there. Not there. Yeah. yeah. Um, Everybody we'll gets there. there though. You know, you 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 either take a, a an approach like Brian, or you take an, an approach like Dave, uh, out. You know, which is the more expensive approach. Um, and everybody figures out that there's only one thing that doesn't screw you over over a four plus year time period. I mean, we were laughing about this last night uh, at dinner. Sorry, Jesse, that you couldn't be there. You were missed. But right. again, we were. I got plenty of sleep instead last night. <laughs> <laughs> Not a bad trade off. Uh, Parker and I have gone back and forth for years because when we go pitch Bitcoin, if we find ourselves pitching Bitcoin together with somebody, he is the king of 21 million monetary policy. Like, we're going to, this is the shelling point. Everybody's going to coalesce about around this, which, yes, this is exactly what you should do. But I lean into the network side of things. Like, yes, we do have this. Uh, I think. You lean into both. Obviously, it's 21 million cap supply, extremely scarce, most scarce thing we've ever come into contact with. You cannot change that monetary policy. It's a distributed consensus set of full nodes. And then the network side really enables these things that were literally impossible before Bitcoin launched. And so the point I'm trying to make is that I actually think that's what's going to get Dave's head, um, the, the light bulb to go off in his head with Bitcoin is the network side, like seeing how you can monetize content and stuff like that. Cause that's what he focuses on in content and like how <laughs> it can make his business better. That's what I think. Honestly, like I thought you were going to go and uh, explain how you think that decentralization is more important than 21 million <laughs> decentralization of nodes. I don't think I've ever said that. I thought that was a stick of like Parker's that 21 million matters and that in the, you're no, that no, 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 that's be not sufficiently decentralized. You're mischaracterizing our, our kerfuffles. <laughs> um, it's no, it's like, he's like, don't even bring up the network. It's not worth it. Just focus on 21 million. I do think it is worth it to bring up the network that it can do things that were literally impossible before 2009. If, if yeah. we're going down this memory lane of uh, last night, it, it, <laughs> it, just to send people, if you've never heard, um, you've uh -huh. obviously heard of TF TC, but going back, <laughs> we were sitting at a table with like maybe six people, seven people, and we brought up the montage from the first episodes. And I don't even know if Jesse, if you, if you've listened to this, it is, I'm not sure if I have, you just go back in your podcast player and go to the first three episode is the most, I, I got to re listen to it. Cause we start playing so it. Good. It's, it's Marty, like essentially manic, like <laughs> <laughs> explaining Bitcoin up into the point that he launches the pod. And it's talking about white paper dropping like Halloween, um, 2010, like pizzas, pizza day, <laughs> pizza day and like, uh, it's with Lou uh, from Barstool and he's ex just screaming like who fucking sells for pizza. I'd kill myself. <laughs> it's eighty billion dollars now. It's just like it's it's incredible. Um, uh, I was I was so I literally it's so funny. It was six years ago. Now at this point, I literally scripted that podcast. Like I wrote it on many pieces of paper and read it into a mic. That's how little I knew about podcasting. At that, like Lou thought I was crazy. I was like in the bars, the offices. People were walking by, like, what the hell is this kid doing in there? Yeah, it was it's amazing. Yeah, it's a good. Um, I got to go re-listen to it because I mean I haven't heard it. In uh, years. When you started playing it last night, it was the first time I've heard that episode in a, in a few <laughs> years, and I, uh, it is. I mean, it is nostalgic and it is fun to look back on, but it is also like cringeworthy. I'm like, oh god! I and every so, couple years, I was so nervous. Every couple years, people are like, "When's the next montage?" <laughs> so, the, I started writing the next montage. Is that 100k? Okay. Once we get to 100k, right. um, so it could could take us five years going to be a long montage if that's the case <laughs> conference day <laughs> the content i mean conference maybe day. uh on, on that is the the content it i mean you know this more than anybody how important the content is um i think about my experience in that 
at the time listening to that and thinking, you know, the prices like just crashed. You're sitting there 17, 18, it's 18. And you can't talk to this, um, to anybody about this stuff because there's nobody to talk to. <laughs> Everybody's either gone or you're an idiot. You don't even know if you're, you're in the whole, you're in the red and you're still buying, <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> but then like you listen to the pod and, and you listen the week, you know, week over week with like you man and all this stuff. And it's just like this reinforcing, helping, like there's other people out there that are doing it. And then, um, that understand it. You're not crazy. But then I think about, you know, the experience we talk about, what's the secret or the trying to put together the package to go talk to these investors. And I'm insanely excited about like what Brian's background and the stuff he's already been doing, all, all, whether it's like formally on the blog or the, the tweet threads on Sundays that are pulling these disparate pieces that we talk about. There's like this alpha when you come and you pull at two sides of the spectrum and when it meets in the middle is like when real like magic happens. And um, so I don't know if you want to talk about any of the Sunday things, but also just like some of the ideas to the extent you feel comfortable and then yeah. others you want to just throw no, I mean, launch. General, launch. Generally speaking, like my point of view on it is, you know, we've talked about this before, like meeting people where they are. I think that's part of it, but it's also just recognizing the fact that people understand things in different ways and, and different things are going to resonate for different people in different ways. And so you need to just have sort of a toolkit of all different ways of approaching this thing. And, and so one thing that we've been working on in the past few weeks is like framing the perception of like, and, and you guys have talked about this on the pod before, but like, where, how do I bucket it? And it's like, okay, you could think about it like that. And let's, let's run through some possible ways that you could bucket it in your traditional asset portfolio, whether you want to take sort of a private equity venture capital lens to it and say, you know, this is early stage growth tech with, you know, similar sort of um, risk reward dynamics. Um, another similarity there is, again, that long term horizon. Um, Jesse mentioned the lockups with, you know, VC and, and private equity. Similar in that sense, like you need to be thinking about this thing long term. So that's sort of one way you could bucket it. Another one is um, just sort of most squarely as a commodity, right? Like this is a real asset, this is a digital commodity. And and some people get that, but back to what I said earlier, it's like some people just don't care about commodities because they've been living in a world where they think 2% inflation is okay and it's not a problem. And um, so they haven't ever thought about hard assets. Um, but that is another way to bucket it is, you know, digital commodity, it's digital gold. And third way is what Michael Saylor did, which is this is cash, this is a cash equivalent. It's just a better version. Um, and I'm gonna put it on my balance sheet and just and hold it instead of holding cash. Um, and so those are sort of like some different frameworks that you could think through around trying to meet people where they are in terms of how they think about asset classes and, and the buckets. Um, but ultimately it's gonna be different for everyone in my mind. Like I think people have their own experiences and their own uh, history looking at different things and, and that influences how how they're going to grasp this thing because it is so multidisciplinary that there are a number of ways that you could come at it. And Marty, I like what you said about, you know, let's focus on the network too, because there there is so much sort of outside of price and number go up, there's ways where this network, the monetary rails is impacting society. And one of, you know, one of my favorite things to tell the normies or just people that are on the outside looking in of Bitcoin is like, for the first time in human history, we can monetize stranded energy through Bitcoin mining. And that, that typically kind of like, makes people step back because nobody nobody really realizes that. And it's, it's things like that that's like, you don't even have to care about the price. Like just, I'm telling you that this is a technology that is doing something that's never been done before. Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, our, our friend Griffin Habies in, in Austin <laughs> this week. And uh, he is the king of the, I mean, that exact quote is what he says. Like he's an oil man, uh, land man. Wildcatter. Wildcatter, whole set seventh generation Texan. We, we will have to get him on the last trade. I don't know if, uh, Jesse, if we've, if we've spoken of him before, but he's a uh, might be too much stash for Jesse. I don't know. <laughs> I've seen his photo. It is glorious. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll definitely we'll do it when Jesse's in Austin. So we'll have this whole group just you know all in person. But um, and he was Texas last night. But that just made me think of like it, that was his light bulb. He explained. He's like, I realized that there was no such thing as stranded energy ever again, and he right. couldn't and it, he could never look back. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean being up close and personal with that particular aspect of, of Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining, great American mining. 
Cathedra and standard Bitcoin, it is truly astonishing. Like particularly the flare gas stuff, like being in the middle of nowhere, North Dakota, middle of winter, but you just have these generators, these shipping containers with these computers in it, and you're literally able to monetize this natural gas that otherwise would have been set on fire in the middle of the North Dakota wilderness. It's when, when, like literally you monetize it, you bring the market to the molecule, monetize it there, and then it's digital gold. You can send it to China from North Dakota if you want to immediately after mining it. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, and the utility is important to, to everybody's point that's made is because um, at the micro level, you, and you keyed in on this like in real time, it's like if you, at a previous episode, it's if it's valuable and it increases in value, then people will want it. And so you'll need to be able to have it to spend, i.e. you don't want it stuck in a, in a fund that you can't actually take it out of. Similarly to uh, an institution that if there's utility in this and it's a cash equivalent or there's some other financial products that will be delivered around having the ability to get the asset in a, some other form, you don't want it stuck in a fund because you can't do any of that. Like we, we don't even know the different ways that credit markets will uh, expand. And I mean, we have ideas and we know have been involved with them. Um, the Unchained Loan Products, an example, there's battery finance that's doing stuff like that. But uh, ultimately it just ties back to the utility of like explaining to them. It's just not like something you just park your money and you know, it's, it's you're gonna wanna understand that you at least want optionality to take possession of the Bitcoin. Um, yeah. And I think the most people, when they come in, they're not going to recognize that. And then we know they're going to go to BlackRock and then they're going to wake up one day and they realize, oh, maybe I need this for whatever reason. And now they're going to have a cap gains hit or whatever. Yeah. Well, I think like setting the cap gains and the overburdensome tax regime here in the United States and other places of the world aside, like, I do think there are tangible examples like this show, for example, if you anybody listening out there on a podcast app actually wants to, it hasn't done this yet. Maybe you have exposure via GBTC or some other fund that it doesn't actually give you um, spot Bitcoin and you don't hold a UTXO yourself. You can actually use this podcast via podcasting 2.0 apps like Fountain, Breeze, Podverse. Just download these apps, listen to the podcast that way, and they double as Bitcoin wallets. You load it up with some Bitcoin. As you listen, you can send a little bit of Bitcoin to each of our wallets. Um, which is pretty crazy. I mean, if you're looking for an example of how you actually use Bitcoin in the real world, like listening to this podcast could be one of those things that has an unlock for you. Yeah. And, and even in that uh, example, we don't even know like podcasting relatively, you know, new or like the medium. And when you can interact in a form of money that's program programmable, how does that change this interaction? Like ideally we play with that at some point. Yeah. I mean, Matt and I play with it uh, on the live stream. Rabbit Hole Recap will do that in 45 minutes when we begin recording. But we'll stream this out over Noster. And we have a Lightning Network public address associated with our Rabbit Hole Recap Noster account. And people will go to zap.stream and they'll listen live and they'll be able to comment and send us Bitcoin. Um, do like super chat stuff using Bitcoin to get us to interact with them. Um, Vita is another good example. I think they're onto some stuff. On the, yeah, 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 definitely. Be just the same, uh, same way, and then what, what they're, they're doing, what they're doing on the telecom side is, I think, it's really important. This gets back to, I think, part of your story, Brian, which is like going to Coinbase with a skeptic lens. Like, I'm, I'm pretty certain that Bitcoin's the signal, but let me actually do my due diligence and dive into this stuff. Write the research about Tezos and all this crap. Oh, it, it is actually crap. Back to Bitcoin, but I think <laughs> this is one of the big categorical errors that. Coinbase and everybody in crypto makes is particularly around like Web 3.0, DeFi. It's creating all these asinine, kakanani tokenomic schemes with a token for each use case, where in reality, what quote unquote Web 3.0 is at the end of the day is uh, com combining open protocols, like open communications protocols, open content distribution protocols with open money and Bitcoin, particularly over the Lightning Network. So <laughs> with this podcast, that's RSS and Lightning Network. We put a Lightning Network address in our RSS feed that this podcast goes on. Um, it goes out to the world. You can find that Lightning hour address um, in our RSS. And if you have an app that has a Bitcoin wallet as, that doubles as a podcast player, you can send us Bitcoin. 
Vita, another example, combining the open SIP protocol, open SIP protocols for telecoms. Like they have 402 hours per payment required errors in that stack too for telecommunications. And you can inject Bitcoin into that. That's what Vita is doing. One of the things they're doing. Um, just another example, L402, we talked about it a few weeks or a month ago when I was in Nashville. Like they did the same thing that Lyle and the team at Vita are doing for VoIP and SIP and they're doing it with the HTTP stack, like fitting it in um, and really solving the 402 payment required error at the HTTP level. So it's, again, when you if you're an institutional investor, like trying to discern what's going on here, like you've heard the Web 3.0 meme, you hear DeFi, I'm... 100 percent certain i've become convinced that the the whole web 3.0 meme in the crypto space has it completely wrong it's really taking open protocols that already exist and just adding open money to them yeah, yeah. they're all competing with money something you just said um made me think of uh like there's this long game being played if if it's if it's bitcoin only and you don't do certain things like rehypothecate collateral and and all the things that either blow you up or put like a sour taste and you know if you're allocating capital and you go into one of these ftx's and you're just kind of like burned your lps are burned everybody's burned your your reputation is um but then it made me think of like the ultimate value investment over bitcoin is actually working or if, you, if there's interest, I guess I would say, but working or investing in like a Bitcoin only company, not investing in, but like investing time in a Bitcoin only um, firm. And, and what hit me and like Brian's an example of this, and it's actually happened previously for years. It's like the best people I've met have cold reached out in the space because it's this form of uh, proof of work when somebody has a, a solo background and they're they're extending themselves and they don't know if they're going to respond and how it's going to you know happen but they they make that jump and then to get involved if we know this to be right and on the other side of it bitcoin is the winner whether it's relationships um the actual uh learnings the the education through the process the whether it's equity in the business the the writing all of it it's like can you imagine any better investment of your personal time no. even more yeah. than bitcoin to be honest like i think yeah, about it gives my, you fulfillment right? it's full fulfillment sure. but it's like the network at this point you're just watching this whole thing grow in at the very like ground level and everybody and everybody you think about the people you've known from the pod and we like talk about matt and like meeting you guys to the pod and just like all of these different interactions in the vehicles whether it was previously on chain or this vehicle and brian now joining and where that goes nobody will know but like the amount of opportunity like actual economic opportunity is it's just insane if this is right so i don't works. even think we could fully grasp or fathom the overall opportunity yeah, yeah I think we're going to be shocked I mean, to the upside that's how i thought about it to be honest, and and part of it was also like recognizing, kind of to Marty, what you were saying just earlier is like we have this really great foundation. Like let's try as hard as we can to build around it, and and create all of these other things that that work around this solid foundation. Like you don't need all those other tokens to do those things. Let's focus on the, the foundation and and build around it. Um, and that's what really you know excited me about getting into you know. Focus, focusing specifically on Bitcoin and, and was just so different than from being at Coinbase. And, and I'll say this, like there there's well-intentioned people at Coinbase. There's very smart people at Coinbase, but there's also just a ton of cognitive dissonance. And generally it comes back to the business model, right? Like the reason they want all these other tokens is because that's how the business model grows. Yeah. Like getting people out the risk curve and having them trade all these different things. And you know what they say, the road to hell. It's paid with good intentions. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. I don't even know if the intentions are good. I um, I don't want to shit on your former employer, yeah. Brian, but uh, I've, do, do I've that. done that on other shows. You can go find that <laughs> if you're if you're really curious about it. Um, yeah, it's it's the whole incentive model over there with A sixteen Z and the, the the various Silicon Valley venture capital arms that have figured out that if they use their connections, their clout to get an allocation to a new crypto token and then hype it up and then use their connections to Coinbase or other um, you know, legitimate tech startups, 
uh, to then dump those tokens. They can get great returns in a very short time frame. When you know we talked about how venture capital usually takes ten years because you have to go find the winners. And to Michael's point earlier, there's no guarantee that you're in one of the winners of the decade. And uh, venture capital is all about finding the Google for the next decade, the Uber. You know, there's only a handful of those every decade, and you need to be in one of them. Otherwise, you're going to underdeliver. You could you could deliver a zero, um, ultimately, if uh, if you pick the wrong ones. And so the, that average of 25% a year is is really a, a small percentage of venture funds delivering well above that, and then quite a few venture funds delivering well below that, um, and being able to use these token models and dressing up in whatever the latest narrative is, Web3 recently, Metaverse recently. You know, in 2017, it was it was uh, specific use cases for niche people. Like I, I popped into my head that uh, Dentacoin existed, which was a <laughs> cryptocurrency, specific, which was marketed as the cryptocurrency for, for dent- dentists. Well, and that, and that got to $2 billion. I just looked it up. It got to $2 billion. Two bill? Holy insane. crap. Well, and now it's a million dollars in total uh, valuation. I'll never forget uh, since we've been talking about Barstool a lot on this episode, I'll never forget like during winter december 2017 like by that point leading through the summer you literally had like ico agencies popped up that were doing consultancy work consultancy work for companies like here here's we're gonna help you like ico no i'll never forget like literally being pulled into an email thread with like erica dave and people from the churning group and like this ico consultancy group like and they were like, Marty, like your Bitcoin Marty, like, what do you think about this ICO? It's like, you can't even run a WordPress website. Like, why, why are you going to launch a token and attach it to your company? Like, this is the dumbest idea ever. Luckily, they didn't launch an ICO, but that's how crazy it got. People were like approaching Barstool, like, you need a token. Well, yeah, yeah. One, of the, one of the other clear sort of manifestations of this, these dynamics that we're talking about is like the reluctance of Coinbase over time to like, work on lightning, right? <laughs> like that was always so clearly reflective of the business model being tied to all the other tokens to me. Cause it's like, okay, even if you have your issues with lightning and you think it's immature, like you should be working on it to make it better. Like, why aren't you? Yeah. Some cognitive dissonance because yeah. they can't, like, yeah. they yeah. literally need Bitcoin to be uh, a dumb gold that only right. does seven transactions per second right. is expensive. They can't acknowledge that. There are these other layers being built that completely debunk that narrative. Do you have a strong take on security tokens and tokeniz- tokenizing like real world assets? I don't have a strong take on it. I mean, we, we need to, I think we people need are going to gonna continue to try to do it. That would be my take. Like, I don't think that concept is going <laughs> away because that in some sense has ultimately some amount of like more of a, a sort of regulatory trajectory where it, it'll be okay to do those things because if you're just mirroring other assets that's less nefarious than creating some new thing. So I think it has a, a stronger path to relevance, but I don't think it's necessary. That, that would yeah. be my take. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I, I agree. I think uh, I, I, I don't have a strong, um, I, I fall in the camp there. I haven't fully thought through and articulated, um, have the like opinion I want to share completely, but I know that there's a lot of people very excited about it, and I feel like we need to have somebody on on, on that we should chat. About. We should probably talk to Alan about this. He's got some good thoughts on it, but I think just generally, Alan like Lane? Uh, Alan Farrington. Oh, um, but I uh, I don't know. I do think there certainly is a bit of opaqueness and um, <clears throat> just pure logistical incompetence at the DC. De- DTCC layer like it is really confusing like most people don't even know how many actually shares are like floating around the market at any given point in time and like the settlement for that layer of like securities is is, like literally working on 1970s tech but do you need a blockchain for it I don't know I do think like the point I'm trying to make is there's definitely efficiencies to be gained that particular layer of I I think there's I think there's an argument to be made that the this is a technology that can reduce the overhead for fractionalized ownership of 
attractive assets like issuing shares for commercial real estate or fine art um there's a world for that but it's but it's it's not that's doesn't amount to like a cryptocurrency it amounts to like a different uh database administration system for carta or angels list (laughs) yeah yeah it's like it right it's and the reason i brought it up is because i it was just like the I think the the folks that we talk with in the circles like we've seen this. I mean, I, I ping you every time it comes up in a feed. Of, <laughs> it or triggers. Like some, it's just like it triggers it's, Michael. It's, so. It didn't trigger. It's just like we saw in an eighteen the STOs yeah. at the time. It was STO security token offerings, and then um, you start hearing through the rumblings, and I think a lot of finance individuals are tied to it because it feels like an innovation and there's and, and i don't know the angle of how they're going to like take their spread in doing this because okay. it will but we're, we're, let me finish the thought so i think that is where where i was going is it's it it ultimately in my mind will end up as an affinity scam in the sense that when we say icos or we say these other things what they do is they play off of this innovation that's in the middle and then you start moving like the blockchain the distributed le- ledger technology the ico and i think this is this like revamp that will start next year or it'll go into next year of the tokenizing the real estate and it's just something that again don't have a fully yeah. formed opinion but would love somebody that is in those worlds because it's my understanding like the equity market is the most efficient market on the planet earth and so do you really need a token to make it more efficient is like right. the question right. But, yeah, but, but it's expensive to, to IPO, you know, like, I think that's the argument is you can reduce your overhead if you have this sort of, but I think like, that's on purpose. I think model. that's just cumbersome of bureaucracy. I don't think that Maybe. has to do anything yeah. with technology, like technology, people form a company like an angel's list than a, but they click a button. Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, like the, these STOs will just be stocks at the end of the day. So like those tokens should yeah, just trade right. like on the value and, of their cash flows and, think, and their margins. I think and you stuff go like through, that. you go through the affinity scams, like, and they get, the most egregious affinity scams happen and then people learn from them and, and four years later they fall for less egregious affinity scams, which are less sweeping and, and uh, horrendous. You know, we went through our, our BitConnect and, and then now we had FTX and those are a little bit different in terms of the, the magnitude of scam. Um, and I think that sort of process just continues with this technology in general that you go through your your overhyped, overpromised affinity scams with STOs. And we had that probably in 2017. And going forward, there will be less and less of that until the terminal state of it is it's just a different form of issuing stock in a cheaper way. So we're just gonna have a longer, uh, what I heard was like a bit, bit connect was whatever, six months, and then FTX was 18 months. And now we're gonna have like a 36 <laughs> month affinity scam that's just gonna go until, uh, until the rug. No, you have to compare. Is it compare FTX to like the Cryptopias and Mt. Goxes of the world? Yeah, right. They're different. But, yeah. you know, FTT ultimately is fraud. Uh, BitConnect is straight up Ponzi scam, scam fraud. Yeah. Do we think BNB and, and Binance is, uh, is. Oh, yeah. Maybe we should. Maybe now's the time to get into yeah, that. You do yeah. want to talk about that. Yeah. yeah. Because that, that is possibly the biggest story for the rest of the year in cryptocurrency markets um will binance follow ftx's collapse uh and for people who aren't aware there's considerable evidence which which is speculative in nature but there's quite a bit of it speculative Um, evidence (laughs) yeah there's a lot of things that line up let's let's put it there's a lot of smoke and so there may or may not be fire here um suggesting that Binance uh, followed a similar playbook as FTX with their their token FTT um, which which was to what what FTX did was they took on um, leverage bets they they uh, borrowed against their FTT positions with it and that created a certain liquidation price point where if the price of FTT fell below that price point, they, their margin, their, their loan would be, there would be a margin call and they uh, would get liquidated. And that's ultimately what happened to FTX. And that was the, the, you know, the, the final chapter of the collapse of, of what turned out to be a $10 billion hole that FTX had on, on its balance sheet. And that was the, you know, the, the carnage that came out of that. 
Um, and right now what's happening is that Binance seems to be, um, Binance's token BNB got up to $600 per coin uh, at the end of 2021. And right now it's been, since then it's been trailing off. Uh, it's now in the low 200s. And there's some evidence that Binance has margin loans that get liquidated somewhere in the low 200s. And they, they're, they seem to be, since June, um, on Binance's platform, there are, have been moments, periods where um, Bitcoin trades at a discount relative to other platforms, so other exchanges. And in those periods, Binance's token, BNB, has been uh, surging, which sort of suggests that Binance has been selling Bitcoin in order to buy BNB, to bid up BNB in those moments in time, um, in order to defend against BNB dropping below a certain price level. So if that's happening, they may or may not have dipped into customer Bitcoin in order to sell that uh, and bid up BNB as they're trying to defend this price point, which could create the same paper Bitcoin claims situation where there's a fractional a fractional reserve for Binance where they don't have as much Bitcoin as customers think they collectively have at you know on hand at Binance um, based on their account, current accounts. So do we get to a point where Binance sells off enough and runs out of cash, runs out of cryptocurrencies to sell in order to bid up BNB if that's what they're doing? in which case we will have a collapse larger than FTX uh, in our near future. I yeah, I, would, I mean, I think they're definitely trying to prop up BNB. Uh, BNB is a complete scam. Uh, so is BNB connected to Binance Smart Chain or do they have like their own BSC token with that too? I forget. Um, Good question. I don't. I never really looked too much into the mechanics. Yeah. So all of, I'm pretty sure it. it's connected to the smart chain. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And so like the, all these stupid tokens. Yeah, that's right. It's the utility token for BSC. Yeah. 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 So Binance Smart. Like each of these exchange tokens has a different flair. FTT essentially got you profit share. Um, right. You, you got a yield on the the, <laughs> the profits that never materialized <laughs> for FTX. Um, they were just stealing people's money. Binance, but BNB has done a bit different. They've like, I think they forked Solana or some other smart contract chain. And like, you can actually build smart contracts with it. So like, that's like a different flair, but it's complete manufactured activity. I would argue right. against speculative evidence there. It's just and, using and the heuristics of, of being in this industry for right. 10 years. They're just propping it up and gaming I, metrics to I make think, it look like people are using it. I think that the best, uh, indicator of that the most suspicious thing in, in my book is is if you look at the price chart of bnb versus bitcoin over the last six years it it has just soared it relentlessly it's the only token over a six-year period that i'm aware of that has dramatically outperformed bitcoin and like it's not even close it's it's it just stair steps up and to the right versus bitcoin and that feels like an Icarus flight to me. Like so, something, something unnatural is driving that. So, um, what is the thought that like they, they are bidding it up because they're skimming, like they're just selling into like liquidity, into exit liquidity. So people are buying it. Um, but if that's the case, the position one would have to be very big to whatever their balance sheet, like the only way I could see that this actually happening. Cause the thing fundamentally FTX was a completely different game in the sense of like, it was from the start, never whole. So, I mean, like, so yeah, so, so like the, but to go through, it's like, this is a casino. This is like a very a valuable casino. And so to make, to let it fall would ultimately mean in my mind, what you described, because I haven't even followed this. I haven't been able to, I mean, looked at Twitter, um, but would mean that CZ has a bunch of Bitcoin. We know it. And he's ultimately going to say, I'm going to take my Bitcoin and go home and I'm going to let this run out because that's effectively what would have to happen. Um, that all the money they've made, all the money he had, we know it's there unless it's just, he keeps trying to prop it up until it goes out. Right. But, but that also like is the whole, how would a hole be that? 
I, I just don't see how it holds that big versus like FTX made complete sense because it was a Ponzi from the start. I mean, going to Jesse's point of like the crazy performance that it's had over right. the last it, years, like creates like, it, the need to keep that pressure be, up. It, right. It could be that they've been successfully using a like leverage trading strategy uh, over time and that they just happened to, you know, maybe they got a little too greedy and they thought, okay, BNB token is at $600 per coin. There's no way it'll get down to 200. We'll we'll lever up to there. Like that'll be our liquidation point. And right now, you know, maybe they miscalculated. Basically, it maybe it it's, just doesn't pass this. Uh, it doesn't pass the smell test. Like the whole thing with FTX, when people no, no, no it definitely does no, no. I'll, I'll explain. I'll explain why. It's be like the FTX. <laughs> just from a from a logical perspective, when FTX went down, the common trope or the thought from everybody was like, why would they ever do this? They were printing money. That was the thought. They actually weren't printing right. money, and it was always a Ponzi. It's like, Binance does print money. They do have a golden goose. So, like, why would they risk that far? Is like, they're they, degenerate no, traders, but that's perfect, dude. But that's perfectly fine, but that's not... There's an extent where you, like, are just a businessman. We've been on the pod talking about CZ being a businessman, being a pirate. Like, to yep. just burn that down for an additional 20%. I mean, unless maybe these guys are... He's a degenerate crazy. gambler. I, I if you go back to like the history of CZ, like you started at OK So Coin. are you on the record saying yeah. that Binance is... You think Binance fails? Uh, I don't... Eventually, yes. Definitely. What would you yeah. prob what's the probability? Um, let's, let's go on the record. Uh, over, over what time? Because if, we th if, <laughs> if, if we're going to talk about it and feel strongly about it, we should like at least have We should have, have Dylan on the podcast for this one because he feels <laughs> yeah. strongly. He feels, yeah. He's been it's, really stupid. I mean, the thing I mean, is, all, he, he might just be timing it well enough where he can he can prop it up until the well, next bull run. And that's, right? like like, all the, that's <laughs> probably what he's trying to do. And all the signals yeah, I think that's right. are there, like particularly like curbing withdrawals, like ninja launching yep. stricter kyc aml uh compliance on users if they want if they're trying to withdraw bitcoin to, to delay having to deliver that bitcoin like this is again having been around for a decade this is like all the heuristic yep. alarm bells are going off like all right they're propping up their own <laughs> their own exchange token shitcoin there um the, the price of bitcoin's moving in lockstep with this thing uh, and they have this massive exchange they're withholding withdrawals from people so percentage chance a hundred percent eventually, fifty uh, <laughs> percent this year. Wow, Jesse, fifty percent end I, of this I year. I would say, I would say ninety percent eventually and fifty percent this year. Yeah, that's. I mean, if we if if, if it's fifty percent, that means we see probably like sub twenty thousand dollar Bitcoin. Bring it. May or, may or may not. So one thing about FTX was that was at the the very end of the bear market, right? That was the capitulation wick where. Yeah. There was the, or, the order book that was thin. <laughs> Binance goes down. We can get another one. Yeah, we'll get another one because people just get scared shitless. Oh, yeah, we'll get another one. But but will it be at a moment in the market where there's so much fear and like and people are so worn out after a year of downtrend that there weren't really that many people bidding is That's what I mean. Point. Versus now, people would love to get an entry below right. 20K because point. they missed it. You know? What if the Fed hikes t t two times while well, that happens? I don't know. And and, and the, the other thing, the Michael, about like... That actually, actually conspiracy theory. <laughs> Marty <laughs> Jones okay, put a tinfoil hat on now. Like this, I think this is one of the big comments that the SEC has made in regards to like the ETF approvals. It's like, hey, we really don't like yes, these offshore right. yes. uh, exchanges. Like, So I, I think this is actually, this would actually be really good for Bitcoin. Um, if sooner than later finance goes down because I, I do think and there's been sort of some back channel rumors about this that the SEC is very unhappy with the, their perception that Binance can manipulate the Bitcoin market because they're so big and they're flouting US regulators and um, and and so you know that may be what's holding up an ETF and, and it may be that if and when Binance wa washes out, um, there's fear in the market for a while, and then, you know, Daddy Wall Street steps in and says, oh, you can trust me, I'll, I'll issue an ETF and it'll be regulatory compliant. And then uh, the SEC greenlights that and, and it, you know, for better and worse, that would be that would bring a lot more capital to Bitcoin. So th there, I think that is part of the story here. I think the other thing. To Michael's point earlier of like, how did they screw this up? Like, they've got the golden goose. 
They're um, degenerate gamblers. <laughs> yes, they're degenerate gamblers. They're also <laughs> the regulators are coming down on them hard right now. So they may have they may have expected you know they sur- they've survived this long because I think they they probably had good risk assessments of like how much of a drawdown can we should we expect um, in in Bitcoin and crypto and in BNB's token price and they may have uh, correctly accounted for that but they may not have accounted for a simultaneous regulatory clampdown which is now cutting they've they're now cut off from the US dollar they do not have a banking partner that can get into and US Europe dollar. too right and and that's now happening in Europe as well um, their their auditor pulled out and and retracted their um, statements um, in the DOJ is 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 now has now charged finance with a variety of things um, and several of their top executives have bailed recently you just made me it think of like something well, are going bad wait so I'll, wait, I'll actually start so, should, we, should we should we bring Matt in to uh, get no, well, this? Before, before, before that wait just one second <laughs> before you do that that um where I will say that it I could see this actually happening based on from the heuristic of like right. everybody died yeah everybody blew up so like it'd be weird if Binance was the only one. It feels like to Matt, your point, you and Matt would agree if we want to pull him in and get let's, his quick thoughts on this. All right, let's pull him in. Here we uh, just do a Jesse yeah, I'm, thing. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna. There was a great post uh, highlights all of the shit that's going wrong for Binance right now. Um, Are we live right happened. now? Yeah, we're live. No, we're not live. We're recording. Oh, we got we're recording. Quickly. We wanted to pull you in because we're talking Binance. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, we're, we're in the middle of the episode right now. How yeah, far yeah. <laughs> no, we're at, the, the we're at the tail, tail end. But maybe Jesse set the scene, scene of what we're in okay, the, yeah, the we, sides. All right. So we're so we're talking about, you know, is Binance Blow. a repeat? Uh, is it a repeat of FTX? Is that what's happening right now? Uh, Michael pressed us to bet, uh, put out our, our wagers on what's the likelihood of Binance collapsing eventually and likelihood this year. Uh, Marty and I feel similarly that it's, 90 to 100 percent eventually 50 percent chance this year do you think that this golden goose of binance is going to succumb to some uh, fraudulent activity or over leveraged bullshit that they may or may not have been engaging in what are your thoughts you think 90 <laughs> percent this is why we brought you in because i was just i had this same response I was like what the hell do we 90 percent eventually have, 90% eventually? What does that mean? At some point. Well, well my, <laughs> my take on that is... All coins turn to zero. The, um, yeah. they, they, they're the, the DOJ has accused them of uh, flagrant mo- uh, money laundering, um, in, in particularly yeah, with yeah. Russians. That's, like, so I, that uh, hammer comes down at some point. Um. I, I, I mean, I think it's completely different than the FTX situation. Um, I'm going to be very careful not to do a Roger Veer. Uh, <laughs> Matt, I um, said exactly what you basically are, um, are going to say or were afraid to say. Or like a Mount Gox is fine comment. But, uh, you know, Binance, <laughs> Binance has been around for a long fucking time. Uh, it does not mean that they can't rug at will. Every custodian can rug at will. Um, and everyone should learn how to hold Bitcoin themselves and 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 self custody. Um, but Binance has been around for a long time. They have a massive market share. Um, it's hard to track volume numbers because they can be faked. Um, but uh, I I think I think objectively everyone agrees that Binance is the leader by far in terms of actual. Uh, you know, market penetration and users and, and, and volume and, and Bitcoin held on the platform. Uh, they make their addresses very clear um, so people can track their addresses. Uh, I think Glassnode has them at over 700,000 Bitcoin or nearly 700,000 Bitcoin in, in de- deposits held on their platform. That's like $18 billion at current valuation. Um, and just for some context, Glassnode didn't know how much FTX had, and everyone thought that they had like great OPSEC on their wallets, but it's probably because they had no fucking Bitcoin the whole fucking time. Um, and, you know, SBF came out of nowhere. He was like this Fiat Maxi that came out of nowhere, flew too close to the sun. 
And then, of course, like on the Binance side, you have the DOJ issues. But I, I that has always been the case. I mean, it's it's kind of like a tether situation in my book is like CZ is his enemy has always been the U.S. government. He's obviously running a shadow bank that's completely detached from them and their hegemony. Um, so they he has a huge target on his back. So does Tether. Uh but that doesn't mean that the tether truthers are based in reality when they say like that, you know, tethers an outright scam like tether can rug at will. The U.S. government could hit them with a cruise missile or some shit and it could be worthless overnight. Um, and I kind of like I kind of put Binance in the same bucket. Like I think CZ um, is a massive shit corner. Um, I think BNB is 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 essentially a scam. Um but, but I think stick around. Grounded. He's grounded. He's one of these like OG shit corners that's like grounded in the value of Bitcoin. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how to put that, but he's a he's a Bitcoiner first, uh, shit corner second, and it's it's like a different category. It's hard to you know. Man, explain. I want to I want to say that's very impressive that you we like ninja launched you into a pod and you just rattle <laughs> off e- exactly the case with all the data. <laughs> Well, everyone's been screaming Binance bank run. So I was like, looking. I was actually looking into it this last few days. Yeah, we just yeah. like ninja launched in a party rip. <laughs> yeah, just to the audience, we're, I thought I was recording Rabbit Hole Recap. So I joined the link and uh, <laughs> these fellas were recording the last trade. Well, we are wrapping up the last trade. I know you have to go. I'm, we, I mean, I'm good now, but we're, it, Matt and I have to record Rabbit Hole Recap. Should, should we just... Rabbit- Recap? Should we just roll into a party rip for rabbit hole recap? <laughs> Can you like use a restroom really quick? Or yeah, just... yeah, let's do a break and then roll into a party rip. Let's do it. Works okay. for me. All right. Sure.